hope everyone enjoyed the main stage today. There was, I had the pleasure of obviously talking to a lot of amazing uh, people who are working at sort of the forefront of, you know, various topics that we're going to touch on today. As sort of mentioned throughout, one of the things that we do as an organization, PSFK, is produce reports on a regular basis on all things related to retail innovation, customer experience innovation, brand innovation. Obviously, purpose is a big part of that conversation as well. This report was foundational for helping us understand some of the sort of key conversations that are happening in the industry at large, what is sort of driving consumer sentiment and attitudes as well, and then obviously led us to um, help select some of the speakers who um, we just heard from earlier today. So Lauren and I will ultimately share eight trends that we are seeing related to purpose, share some best in class examples that, that highlight the ways that, that, that those are coming to life, and then um, leave off with some takeaways that kind of wrap everything together. So, um, you know, I think for me, just sort of reflecting on the conversations that happened on the main stage today, I think um, the fact that th that that purpose is now a business, there's a business case for purpose within the context of an organization, both internally and how that ultimately is um, reflected in outputs to your consumer and to your community, I think is super important. The sort of effort and the research and the thoughtfulness that needs to go into these efforts, I think is um, super interesting and important and in how that is now the same consideration in terms of the external product or service that you're offering to, to a customer is going into um, the way that purpose shows up in your organization, I think is, is hugely important. And then, you know, just again, thinking about what's sort of happened over the past 12 months or so, how, especially for younger consumers, they're more and more what they believe in is also being reflected in how they're spending their money and what and, and how they are holding um, brands and companies accountable. So let's take a moment to just kind of think, look at generally speaking, just a few things related to that sort of consumer sentiment. Um, so things like um, diversity and inclusivity are obviously big um, factors for consumers as well as um, trust, especially given, you know, trust is such a hot button topic these days. What does it mean? How is it sort of disinformation and all of these things like sort of traveling within the broader kind of culture that um, it's so important for brands to maintain that level of um, authentic authenticity and transparency to sort of gain and, and, and keep consumers trust. So, um, you know, 50% of, of respondents um, in, in a survey from Edelman Trust um, feel brands must help um, others in order to earn and maintain consumers trust. So again, sort of thinking about how that sort of resonates within the, the broader community. Um, and then, you know, things, things like racial sensitivity training are obviously a big part of how that sort of comes to life um, and, and the importance that consumers sort of feel in terms of how that's reflected in their customer experience. We see that, um, that sustainability, obviously, again, more and more is becoming table stakes and then how you further sort of move and differentiate that from a brand point of view, how important that is. Um, so just, um, you know, 60% of consumers are, um, you know, willing to change their shopping habits in order to sort of um, make a difference in terms of their own personal environmental impact. Um, and, you know, it is, it is an important issue. Obviously, obviously behavior change is a harder thing to sort of, um, make happen on the, 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 the sort of on behalf of consumers. Um, and then, you know, we talked a little bit about transparency, but traceability initi initiatives are increasingly important to con consumers. 
they're willing to pay a premium for brands that can sort of provide that level of transparency. I think, you know, connected with this is storytelling, not just the sort of sustainability that you can do from a brand perspective or a retail perspective as well. And so I think these are all sort of important considerations. And again, tied to the way people are willing to spend today. Um, and then, you know, finally, I think um, community, particularly looking back at what's sort of happened, both from a pandemic point of view, from the Black Lives Matter movement, um, all of the ways that, um, that, that brands can kind of step in and provide support in various ways to their um, communities is, is super important. So we see um, that 77% 70, of respondents in, in one poll believe that brands should step in and support their local communities. Um, you know, particularly that, that number gets even higher when we think about vulnerable communities as well. And, um, you know, the importance that digital plays within the context of that experience too. So, um, you know, getting, building community through digital and how that, what level of support that they can provide as well. Um, the, just to kind of give you a little bit of insight into the PSVK process, um, you know, we're researchers at heart. We are um, looking at what's happening, the latest and greatest in terms of, you know, again, um, new initiatives from brands, new technologies, um, consumer insights, new retail, whatever the case is, whatever we're interested in sort of tracking, we're kind of gathering that all together and then um, going through the process of doing pattern recognition to ultimately define what we see as the sort of trends that are shaping the marketplace. Once we kind of have that landscape established, we have all these, these amazing examples that show how that's actually coming to life within the marketplace. And then that enables us to um, help then our brand partners or our members or whoever that might be sort of understand what this means for them and, and why that matters. So what we'll do with each of these is we'll ultimately talk about the trend that we're seeing and then we'll highlight that with an example that brings that idea to life. So the first, the first idea here is what we're calling inclusive initiatives. Um, obviously brands are, um, and organizations at large are taking a, a broader look at who um, the makeup of their audience or their community is. Um, they're thinking less in sort of binaries um, and embracing a, a broader um, and, and a broader range of, of consumers and then creating experiences that help them feel welcome within the uh, a physical space or in the context of a, of a conversation that's happening. This might look, this might be services that, that um, are more catered to a sort of, um, you know, a broader audience. It could be environments, it could be products. There's a lot of different ways that this ultimately shows up. Yeah, so here we're looking at both how businesses and retailers are both making a purposeful shift towards inclusivity and representation and their commitment to considering, you know, consumer perspective and needs they may have not been previously. And then we're also looking at how retailers are taking those conversations one step further and creating these accessible experiences within their own communities. And one way we've seen this come to life is within um, a London concept store from Adidas, where shoppers now navigate its collections by sport and aesthetic, um, and it really allows them to browse based on personal taste rather than gender. And I like this example because along with all of the consumer research that I'm sure Adidas conducted, they started by consulting their employees. And this was designed for specifically for consumers like within the 18 to 24 Gen Z age range. But they consulted employees first and tapped into this their own internal community to see what they were looking for from a shopping experience, what was missing for them, and then were able to actually lever leverage that insight for a new experience. So just a smart way of seeing that come to life. Yeah, and I think some of the things that you touch on there, Lauren, are, you know, again, sort of echoed in the conversation that we had earlier today. The fact that, um, you know, anything that a brand is doing, whether that's um, thinking about a new product or um, how they show up in, you know, in terms of this broader sort of notion of purpose, it's, an, it's a listening exercise. Um, you can't, 
sort of make assumptions now in terms of how you should be catering to a, to your audience. And so in this case, listening to employees internally and, you know, in my conversation with Ezene, um, you know, she mentioned the fact that there's a, there's a desire amongst uh, employees today to sort of be involved in some of these, these processes. So how, um, how you sort of get their buy-in early on and even um, insight to, uh, to understand what's going to, what's going to ultimately resonate and be, sort of impactful for them. And then of course, thinking about the way that you involve your consumers in the process and, and ultimately ensure that whatever it is that you're putting out into the market is gonna be that much more relevant in the end. So, you know, particularly amongst a younger demographic, I think we're seeing that gender fluidity, sexual fluidity are all things that are extremely important. And so again, the, the sort of typical retail journey is there's the men's department and the women's department. And, um, you know, that assumes a lot of, uh, that makes a lot of assumptions about your audience and what they're ultimately interested in. And I think there's, you know, this creates an, a new and interesting way of, you know, bringing discovery, you know, if we're talking about selling things at the end of the day, um, making discovery a new way, a new part of the product process and not defining what consumers need to be wearing themselves, but um, you know, allowing them to make those decisions for themselves. So I think that's all really interesting. Sorry, let's see here. Um, and then there's a um, the ability to listen to, listen to those voices and then sort of amplify that in in various ways. And and again, this is. This manifests in terms of employees, it manifests in terms of your consumers or shoppers. And then also uh, a lot of what we're seeing is um, how this manifests in the, the partners that you are working with or collaborating with, um, especially from a big brand perspective. You have an incredibly powerful platform. You already have a huge built-in audience. And so, bringing in, um, you know, voices that might not always have a seat at the table and giving them an, an opportunity to sort of speak for themselves or share their ideas or share their products is a huge boost. And I think that creates a lot of, um, a lot of excitement and, and engenders a lot of uh, affinity amongst consumers today as well. Definitely. And so within this idea of amplifying voices, we wanted to highlight the beauty and skin care platform 13 Loon because it's not only providing black and brown owned brands with a space to reach consumers, but it's also providing consumers with the direct access to a range of brands that have been concepted and then designed specifically for them, which is something I mean, you can see just based solely on the continued success of Fenty Beauty, like huge opportunity within beauty, but then also every other retail industry. And what's great about 13 Loon is beyond selling product, um, it also features each of the brand creators that they have on their site. So you can find stories about them um, on the website as, also, as well as 13 Loon's like social channels. And consumers can tap into different interviews um, with skin and beauty experts, and then also just really develop that deeper connection to these brands, which I think is great. So, yeah, and I think you know you you raise a really interesting point, Lauren, in talking about the the sort of the various ways that this can be activated beyond just yeah. the the sort of selling experience. You know, there's all of these storytelling aspects that can happen content as we've seen particularly within a digital context is so important in terms of how brands are aiding discovery and finding new audiences and then i think there's you know one of the things that i love is you know these niche audiences are often super they're super involved they're super engaged there's a lot that can be learned from these niche audiences that can, can be applied more broadly as, as a brand or an organization. And then again, there's the opportunity to, if you are leading in terms of engaging, um, you know, some of these diverse audiences in new ways, then they're going to, the, the opportunity to create loyalty and advocacy are, are yeah. grow 
and then obviously to, to sort of build from there. And I mean, this is, we call this amplification, but I think this can be amplified from the standpoint of um, the community as well. And we, we see how impactful that is in terms of, you know, getting that organic kind of growth as well. Definitely. So this next idea is something that um, we touched on within the context of um, the conversation that I had today with Ofdel. Um, there is now a desire for brands to not only talk about the things that are that they're doing, but actually um, taking meaningful action and then being held accountable for what it is that they're doing. Um, and this, I think, goes hand in hand with what we just saw before, which is saying, which is not just taking a stand in words only, but then um, you know putting putting hard numbers or data behind what it is that you're doing, and then being very open and transparent about how you're sharing your progress as a part of that. Definitely. And so, from a business or corporate perspective, accountability, you know, it's not just it's just if not more important than simply stating your support um, for greater diversity or inclusion on your social channel, right? And so a great example of how this has kind of come to life this year. So from Aurora James, there's the 15% pledge, and this was touched on earlier today. Um, but it's basically making sure that brands and retailers who are taking a position on inclusivity and diversity are following through on that. So it's a nonprofit uh, organization and it's calling on mega organizations, right? To analyze their shelves, their contracts, who they're partnering with, um, reflect on any internal biases that might have led to, you know, not having a super diverse product range. Um, and then also taking that one step further and pledging to it dedicate 15% of their shelf space to black owned businesses. So, so far brands like Sephora, Rent the Runway, Macy's, they've all taken up this pledge um, and they've committed actually to creating advisory groups and um, de like devoting money towards this cause. So it's great because it's addressing inclusion from a systemic point of view, but it's also making inclusivity and diversity across the business, this ongoing conversation rather than a one-off moment. Yeah, and I think you you touched on something that came up in the conversation that I had today with Esne, which is the sort of um, notion of reflecting on um, in being sort of honest with yourself as a business or an organization with um, what is actually happening and and how you you know for po you know positive or negative, it's hard to do that sort of you know as an individual, it's hard to be. Um, sort of honest with yourself sometimes and, you know, obviously at large in, a, in an organization, there's a lot of warts probably that exist and you're not going to be able to fix everything right away, but, may, but, but doing that sort of hard work initially and then figuring out what are the steps that need to be in place in order to do so. And, and to your point, Lauren, making this an ongoing process rather than something that just is like, it happens and then it's kind of forgotten about or it loses favor that, you know, these things are, are longstanding. They need to continue to evolve. And, you know, I mean, 15% makes sense now, but, you know, why, you know, is that, that's a starting point. Like, you know, what is stopping us from sort of, you know, evolving that or whatever the case is in terms of how your organization is thinking about these things. Like, once you get to 15%, can you strive to get, you know, deeper and further and continue to be more innovative? So again, like that idea of all of these things being an ongoing process, I think is hugely important. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, everything that we've seen is that, you know, specifically with social media being such a mouthpiece for individuals today to, you know, talk about positives and negatives that, you know, this is a huge opportunity to, um, you know, make sure that you're owning the conversation rather than reacting to what people are saying about you as an, as, as an organization as well. So, I, you know, it's again, like, if you're not going to participate, then others are going to do it for you. And so I think, I think, again, to be leading in this context is, is really important. 
you know, shifting the conversation a little bit, we talked we talked about diversity and inclusivity, and um, you know, sort of social in terms of how you're responding to a more a, a different audience or a niche audience or a changing audience. Now we look a little bit at how organizations are um, addressing sustainability and um, how they're setting up their business models or what that means in terms of. Um, you know, how they're selling or the products that they're making, et cetera. And so we love this idea of closed loop commerce, which is, you know, again, thinking about the full life cycle of a product. I think traditionally, particularly when it comes to packaging, the onus has been put on the consumer to figure out what happens when, you know, the things that my, my product came in or the product itself has, you know, sort of reached the end of its life. Um, and businesses are, are taking more of a ownership over that experience and sort of at least helping consumers, you know, to sort of help with that sort of continuous product life cycle, whether that's how it gets recycled or how it gets resold or whatever the case might be. Yeah, so tapping into this idea of on-demand replenishing recycling programs, Human Race is a skincare company that focus on, focuses on environmental and social impact. And it was created by the multi-hyphenate Pharrell Williams, who you'll probably know either as a musician, a producer, or an entrepreneur. And so Human Race products, they're not only made from vegan ingredients, but they're also packaged in reusable containers. And those containers are also 50% post-consumer recycled landfill plastic. So they've definitely done a lot of work towards making this product as sustainable as possible. Um, and just to reduce waste, these containers are replenished with recyclable refill cartons. Um, so just emphasizing their sustainability aspect there. Uh, and I know there's, I think this was in the last week or so, Dove came out with their deodorant and they're gonna be doing something similar. And there are a lot of companies, um, a lot of directed consumer companies who are doing this with um, self-care a lot where their packaging is, uh, you are able to replenish it without having to buy a totally new plastic container. Um, and then with human race specifically, there's just another added level here. So each of their containers actually is printed with the product names in Braille. So just another like little level of inclusivity there that I think is cool and worth calling out. Yeah, this is great. I think for sure within the beauty and personal care space, this has been something that is beginning to emerge in terms of how that sort of end product is able to be refilled or um, you know recycled in some in some way, shape, or form to to really reduce the impact because you know these things are often you know products that we're using on a regular basis and and obviously are um, you know have a short shelf life in terms of how long we're actually using them or owning them so. You know, once you see a, a, a major company like Dove sort of um, getting in on on something, then that obviously can move the needle on a on a in a major way. I think the other thing that is interesting to me just about this notion of closed loop commerce is so much of the there there's a the, the physical retail space becomes a competitive advantage or at least an opportunity space in terms of how you then can either take back or refill or you know replenish products in you know whether that's um, at a partner or in an own space it as opposed to then um, you know having to go through um, using the mail or whatever the case is which you know obviously comes with its own set of of challenges and, and sort of carbon footprint so I think that's really interesting as well and just as a broader consideration alongside of this. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the B Corp cert certification, as you mentioned, is, um, I think is, is really interesting. I think, I don't, I don't know if that fully got, um, it was able to sort of come out within the com conversation that I had with Ben and Tom from Seedlip, but I think their whole point is that, um, these third-party certifications hold you to a higher standard in some ways, and 
um, you know, gives you something to sort of strive for. And again, we talked about accountability before to be held accountable for it too. So, um, and then, uh, you know, alongside of, alongside of this sort of notion of, you know, circular business is just sort of helping consumers understand in, um, you know, a more, in a more clear way what the impact is of some of their purchase decisions. There's a lot of different things that are happening in terms of um, how we see that, we see companies, um, and I, I recognize I think we have the wrong or a repeated uh, text here, but in terms of how companies are being more, more transparent about the impact that purchases are having, a lot of this is happening on, you know, packaging is one, we see digital and sort of apps to sort of, you know, and in some cases, third party apps that help kind of back that out. Um, some interesting examples within the financial space that's actually helping create a carbon footprint based on the things that you're actually buying through, um, you know, credit cards or through your bank or what have you. Um, and then also an interesting opportunity around receipts as well. Um, and so, you know, why don't we, sh why don't we showcase what, um, what that example is that we have here? Yeah, so if you're not familiar with Ask It, they're a Swedish clothing brand, and they were actually founded on this idea of offering complete transparency between brand and consumer and launched with a full cost breakdown, um, similar to Everlane. I know they do that as well to a degree. Um, and so that cost down included, you know, price of raw materials, labor, markup, everything. So they had this full description of their ma like manufacturing process. And so now the brand's taking that one step further and they're providing an impact receipt for four of its most popular styles. And that impact receipt details everything um, that, that's environmentally impacted with from each item. So it includes CO2 emissions, water consumption, and then energy use as the result of that piece's production. And so there's here there's both that element of providing customers with access to like behind the scene production policies, but there's also accountability here to a degree because they're showing their consumers how they're committing to providing an eco-conscious product as well as the steps they're taking to deliver that. And that's why I like this example. And just to respond to um, one of the comments that just came through from, from Josh, I think, you know, 100% right that, um, you know, it's interesting, especially with these big holding companies that have, you know, are sort of multi-brands under a, you know, sort of larger corporate umbrella. It's, you know, when you have, when you have your one sort of sustainable brand and then, um, you know, whatever your sort of, um, you know, 10, 10 other sort of, let's call them quote unquote normal brands um, with, you know, less transparent practices, it's, um, you know, it does feel a little bit like greenwashing. And so, you know, again, I think the, there's there's still work to be done in terms of how a, a total organization kind of works together and what their broader sort of stance is. And I think, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the onus is still on consumers to sort of continue to, um, you know, cho shop with their dollars and then obviously like call out the, the, the brands that are not, um, you know, sort, you know, perhaps living to the living up to their full set of values, so to speak. Um, but it is, you know, even on a small level to see the, these innovations sort of begin to kind of move the needle and then perhaps again, like, um, you know, starting small and then adopting this on a, on a broader scale is, is quite interesting. And then, um, you know, you know, we, this, this came up in the context of my conversation with Carla from Kuyana, this sort of notion of, again, building these things into your business model. So how you can, um, you know, bring buyback naturally into the context of continuing that, that sort of ongoing relationship that you have with consumers, perhaps rewarding them um, in terms of um, the, you know, what, what happens in terms of that buyback and we're giving these, you know, uh, items a second life that can be, you know, sort of further used or enjoyed within the, the sort of, you know, their life cycle as well. 
Oh, yeah. So Levi's Second Hand is a buyback and resale program that they recently launched, and it allows customers to turn in used denim pieces for a reward. And then Levi's is able to recycle these pieces on its secondhand marketplace and resell them. So after each uh, piece is donated, Levi's, they assess each one, um, and customers are able to receive $15 to $25 in a gift card. And then they've part Levi's is partnered with a logistics startup called Trove, who then takes over. So they ensure each piece is laundered, measured, uh, photographed, and then posted to the online store. And so I like this example of buyback, which is something other retailers in different industries are trying out. Like I know West Elm and I think IKEA are trialing this as well. So it is popping up like outside of just fashion but it's such a great way to re-engage your consumer post-purchase while also tapping into that like vintage thrifting mindset. And that's all while encouraging this bigger conversation around like environmental and recycling. So a good, a good call out here, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you really hit it on the head when you talk about, I mean, this is a lot of this is obviously being driven by the fact that vintage, particularly among um, a younger demographic who is is used to sort of buying fashion, in particular through sites like Depop um, is the one that sort of immediately comes to mind. It, it's like a built-in behavior. Obviously they have, generally speaking as consumers have, um, you know, lower disposable income. So there's an advantage for them to sort of buy things that are used or vintage, but you know, it, it is, it's a more sort of mainstream behavior amongst that demographic. And, and, you know, again, going back to my conversation with Afdel, this is, there is a business reason for doing this. You sell the item once and then you recoup, let's say 60% of the value when you resell it again. And, um, you know, and then you're encouraging your consume, your existing consumer who brought back that um, product to sort of buy again. So there's, you know, it's like this need, there needs to be a revenue driving um, sort of notion behind most of these things. And, and I think it's, it's, it's not, a, it's a good thing to recognize that. And it's, you know, a smart way of doing, you know, if, if we're talking about sustainability from, an environmental point of view, but then also from a makes sense for business point of view, these are all important considerations to kind of have as a part of that as well. You know, within the context of, you know, multiple conversations that I had today, this, this sort of idea of the role that the employee plays within the broader organization, obviously, um, if we're talking specifically about retail, your frontline employees in particular are the ones who are creating that brand experience for your customers. So they're hugely important there. They have a lot of passion and desire for, um, you know, a, a lot of employees are not just working for a paycheck, they're working for your organization for a particular reason. And so, you know, we talked about this at the outset, um, customers are aware of how, what role employees play they are aware of how organizations and treat their employees, particularly, um, you know, reflecting back on the sort of height of COVID and, um, you know, the brands that really sort of stood out were the ones that were um, being um, smart about or, or being compassionate um, and empathetic to, to their employees. So all those things kind of play a role here. And then again, recognizing that as an organization, you have all these amazing resources to support your employees. Um, and so how do you actually like bring that to bear within the context of your broader experience? Yeah, so a lot of this events this year have really given rise to a need for retraining and a need for new skills among employees, um, especially as companies have looked to like move operations and customer services online. And I really love the idea of taking that human first approach, uh, not only with your customers, but also your employees and really help them and support them, um, whether that's through training or just resources that can impact their well-being outside of their job as well as within it. So we wanted to call out Walmart here and their Live Better You program for employees. And it's been expanded to become more available to all employees rather than just at the corporate level. 
and it focuses on digital skills. So they've partnered with different universities and now Walmart employees can pick up um, 19 certificates that they can earn. Uh, the program costs $1 a day. So, you know, a great accessible resource here includes free student coaching, college credit, and then also just opens up this career pathway um, for their employees to, you know, move on from their position to grow with the company um, and just sets them up for better success. And so again, just like a great accessible um, example, but impactful way to support your employee ecosystem, which feels very, very important now within the retail space. Yeah, and I would I would add, you know, as I was as I was, you know, hearing you talk about this, and then just sort of thinking about how how this sort of more largely kind of functions within an organization. You know, we talk so often about customers being advocates or ambassadors for a brand and more and more what we're seeing is that um, you know successful organizations are leaning into employee ambassadors as well and I think in particular Walmart is um, tapping into a lot of their employees through TikTok um, to have them sort of showcase and sort of um, you know amplify what it is that an organization is doing um, you know, kind of naturally and through the platforms that they're already kind of using. So, um, you know, I think that's really interesting. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if the, in many cases, probably those employees are not getting paid extra to do that. Um, maybe they should be, I don't know. I guess it depends on sort of how well that is, um, you know, kind of um, amplifying the brand message, but these are all things that are su super important and, and should be considered. And again, like the success of an organization starts with their employees and, and how um, not only the, you know, I, I think there's so much sometimes around the, you know, bells and whistles that you offer, but some of these core things that allow them to sort of evolve um, and grow as people, I think are, you know, it's equally or more important. Um, and then I just wanted to address, um, we had Kevin Struthers in the audience just asking a question, any research that shows retailers implementing more than one trend at a time, does success require addressing uh, more than one trend? I think, you know, I, I I think generally speaking in the research that we do, I don't have any sort of statistics or data to sort of back this up. We find that, you know, the, the leading organizations often are the ones that are, that are doing multiple things well. Um, and I think that probably holds true with, with purpose. That said, um, you know, again, going back to some of the conversations that I had today on the main stage, I think we've seen that, um, uh, that a focus, at least initially, and especially from a sort of um, smaller emerging brand point of view is extremely important because then it's very easy for the organization and the employees to understand what it is that the company is doing. It is um, easy for the consumer to understand. And then, um, you know, on a smaller scale, you're able to make a an impact by focusing. And then I think there's something interesting that again, I think because of timing, we had to edit down some of these conversations, but um, there's, a, there's the ability to become an expert from a brand point of view around some of these like very specific focus areas that I think is really interesting, um, which then allows you to not only um, you know, sort of support your own value or your own mission very well, but then act as a, you know, a collaborator for um, others who are interested in, in figuring out how to kind of, um, you know, move the needle, so to speak. So I think all those things are, are, are really important. And, you know, something we'll keep in mind as we continue to sort of do our research is think about how that all kind of, um, how that all kind of works together across multiple trends. Let's see here. Um, and, you know, again, we, we touched on this um, a bit throughout, but it, brands as a whole, especially, you know, the larger you get, you have a ton of resources at your disposal. You have a 
um, you can serve as a platform that can do a lot of good as we, you know, again, we're in the midst of a retail conference as we think about the social or the the role that the physical store can play within the context of a community. I think there's a lot of interesting ways that that can be activated to provide resources, support, community um, as a way to advance issues that are important um, to you as, a, as an organization as well. Yeah. So We've seen a lot of retailers really show up and help customers and their communities this past year, whether it was providing those educational resources or meeting new community needs. And one way that's taken shape is actually within the physical store. And so here we're highlighting streetwear where retailer Kith, and they actually closed down four of its flagships earlier this year in order to turn them all into voter registration hubs. And so employees were still on site, but rather than like selling clothing, they were redistributing redeployed to be on site to help customers register. So great element there of involving internal teams and associates and with that purpose driven decision again. Um, so that's why we're highlighting that one here. Yeah, and I think again, like in this instance, them, you know, I mean, this is not a, a tough sell from a Kith point of view, like them closing their stores for a couple of days isn't going to adversely impact the business in any way. I mean, if anything, it's going to make their lines longer when they uh, do reopen in terms of their sort of drop. So, I mean, that in and of itself makes sense. But you know, these these can be these can be activated in short term in a sort of physical context, and then hopefully. Um, you know, this continues to live online and, and is not just um, something that sort of um, happens and then disappears in terms of a brand. But, you know, they are catering to um, a, younger dem a, a younger demographic, um, obviously, with the election um, that happened this year in the U.S., there was a desire to sort of get, um, you know, often communities that, you know, perhaps hadn't participated in the election previously, or younger communities that um, you know were were voting for the first time to sign up and get involved. So I think this just makes a lot of sense in terms of their brand and who they're sort of targeting. And it's uh, you know again, sometimes these things can be um, you know very immediate and and sort of relevant to a particular point in time, and then um, you know they 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 disappear. So um, but but interesting to see how the, the physical space, again, plays a role in that, in that story. Um, and then of course, one of the things that we saw, um, you know, happening was that as so much of the, um, you know, physical world shut down in the midst of COVID, that suddenly there was a, a need and desire to show up in a digital context the brands that were most successful were the ones that had already put in a lot of effort into building those communities um, in both a physical and digital context, and then simply needed to kind of flip the switch in order to activate that online. Again, understanding what was going to be relevant to that community, um, how that was going to resonate with them, and then ultimately, um, you know, what, you know, how you kind of all bring that together and, and continue to sort of um, replicate this moving forward as well. Yeah, and so here we're looking at online fitness program Obi, and they created a stream with friends feature recently that allows groups to participate in the same live stream class, right, as they're working out. And so what's great here is that customers who are using this service um, were then like able to actually take it a step further and remotely interact with each other before and after each workout. So similar to that in-studio experience, um, and some were even, they noticed some of their customers were even remaining online together to share coffee or a cocktail or socialize once classes were complete. And so at a time when lockdowns are still happening and social interactions are low on the ground, um, it's just a really nice way to still encourage those in-store, in-studio uh, interactions with customers and also keep that community aspect about your brand alive. Yeah, and I think this is a great point. Like this doesn't always necessarily have to be anything more than bringing people together around the shared interest or passion. Um, it certainly can be beyond that, but 
um, recognizing a you know sort of emerging behavior or need from uh, an audience that you're already speaking to, and then figuring out how to actually um, facilitate that from a brand point of view. I think this makes a ton of sense. Um, I wasn't familiar with this example, um, but I love that you know it's there's that sort of naturally sort of social aspect that's missing from the digital fitness experience and then figuring out ways to sort of you know keep that conversation going sort of it's it, it's not that when you log you finish the workout that you necessarily need to log off right away i think that's really that's really interesting and you know i mean i had my conversation with helena from house today I know they were hosting a lot of live events. You know, many brands were sort of figuring out ways to activate their communities. Um, Harry, was it was it Harry's that was doing the um, the sort of peer to peer sort of mental? Um, yeah. Can you just re remind the audience quickly what what that was? Yeah. So Harry's zeroed in on um, actually providing mental health for their male consumers. And so they, I think they were linking up, they set it up online through their website, I believe, and we're just connecting um, connecting their customers with actual trained um, certified uh, therapists who could help them because they just noticed based on their own research and then looking further into it that a lot of their customers were actually kind of in need of that service, so. Very cool, yeah, so a lot of different ways that I think this ultimately kind of, you know, again, digital creates new opportunities and new ways to engage, which I think is, which I think is great. Um, and then the final trend that we'll touch on today before we share some takeaways right at the end is the notion of, um, you know, tapping into your local community. Um, I think, you know, again, for smaller businesses in particular, but then also you know, brands that have a national or a global footprint, they, it's not, um, you don't necessarily always show up in the same way in every market um, to, you know, that particular audience. There's a, there needs to be a recognition of what is unique about a particular market or a particular neighborhood or whatever the case is, but then different ways that you can, um, you know, sort of step in provide support, again, um, you know, bring communities together, et cetera, that um, is, is really interesting. And it is, you know, with scale, um, you know, there is, a, there is a need for sort of consistency from a brand point of view, but that can kind of manifest slightly differently um, at a local level as well. Yeah, and I think local support is something that's on the mind of consumers and brands. So looking at how brands and retailers can support their local communities and fellow businesses. I mean, I know here in New York, every single restaurant, bar, neighborhood retailer are on social, like shopping out um, their favorite places to go, new meal kit deals, anything to kind of like help generate more awareness for their other businesses in their neighborhood. Um, so there's really been an effort to help support each other as much as possible. and. A really wonderful example of this. Um, we talked to Helena earlier today, obviously from House, um, but they came up with this, uh, the restaurant project. And so House, just to recap, in case you didn't catch that segment, is a naturally made alcohol brand and it was developed as a D2C brand and it has its own in-house manufacturing, which is important. So after initial lockdowns, um, they were able to put, uh, or were able to actually partner with nine different restaurants and their owners that they are like on good terms with and know personally. So they created these nine new beverage flavors to be sold on the house website. And they're able to take this from ideation to market in two weeks, which is like the impressive part here. And 100% of profits went directly to each of the featured restaurants. So overall, it's just a great way of how a brand was using their own resources to help out those who are looking at a ton of uncertainty and really just directly impacting and supporting fellow businesses. Yeah, and I love that sort of partnership sort of collaboration aspect. I mean, obviously the there's an opportunity here for, for House to continue sort of selling these new beverage formulations because bars and restaurants are so important to how they grow and sort of aid that discovery as, as a brand, I think, 
establishing those relationships is is really interesting and important as well. So just a lot of great things to sort of like about what they did with this particular project. So finally, let's see here. Oh, I just um, just a couple things to take away, and I, I tried to address some of these at the beginning of the presentation, and then hopefully these came through in the conversations that happened on the main stage today as well. Um, you know, there is an opportunity nowadays for um, brands to really sort of differentiate through purpose. I think especially where there's some, even, even where there's a baseline set of expectations from consumers, the opportunity to sort of go above and beyond or continue to sort of lead um, with what it is that you're doing within these particular spaces. Um, and then obviously a, a need to sort of translate um, that marketing and the way that you're talking about this to your audience into meaningful action. Um, you know, there, there is no reason that you as a brand or an organization have to participate in every single conversation. Um, you know, I think again, you know, in the same way you might think about, you know, not launching products that aren't in your sort of core category, um, you need to understand where you can add value and where you have a strong point of view or where you have expertise and stick there. Um, just because something is happening, um, in a, in a broader sense doesn't mean you need to have a, an opinion about it or or take action on that necessarily and and when it feels off brand or inauthentic like those are the times when when brands actually get called out for um the the you know attempting to do something good but having it backfire so to speak um you know, again, thinking about corporate sustainability, um, you know, where it is now currently, and then thinking about how you translate that into a business or operational advantage. What are the opportunities to um, take back resources, generate additional sales, um, not being afraid to sort of think about these things as revenue generating or business advantages. Um, it, you know, it's just because it's, it's a purpose-led initiative doesn't mean that there doesn't have to be a business case or, or can't be a business case associated with it. Um, you know, again, diversity and inclusivity, um, create a stronger work culture, create more flexible, nimble, um, more representative um, sort of structure internally. And then that has a big, that shows up for consumers um, in a really interesting way um, based on either not making mistakes and doing the right thing from the get-go, or um, just in terms of better products and services that you're delivering as, um, as an organization. You know, this came across in, in multiple conversations I had with the speakers today is that, you know, corporate social responsibility initiatives, um, they, they are owed the same amount of, of thoughtfulness, research and development um, as any innovation that, a, that an organization is gonna be put forth. You know, if, if this is the thing that you are going to stand behind as an organization, it should have, um, you know, the same level of care associated with it. You know, this is, this is how you show up publicly and in an important way for your customers. Um, and then this, um, you know, I would add, in, listen to your community and employees uh, and constantly um, think about you know, these are not specific endpoints, but they're constant journeys to continue to refine and build and, you know, sort of do interesting things um, as an organization. And, you know, it's just, it, it, for me, this is the stuff that's so exciting in terms of, you know, being able to, to sort of um, do what you already do as a brand and then, um, you know, put um, a level of social impact or social good behind that, I think, is, is hugely important. So um, really appreciate everyone um, taking the time to join. Let's see, we have one more question here. Um, do you have any examples of brand plus retailer partnerships besides house that were uh, successful in the purpose space? Um, you know, again, sort of tangential to the... Um, to the purpose space in my conversation with Eva from Maud, she mentioned the staycation initiative, which 
um, ultimately was bringing a bunch of um, similar sort of synergistic brands together from um, multiple industries to, in the case of COVID, um, share their resources and sort of ways for their communities to sort of stay well, stay active, stay healthy within the context of um, the um, the pandemic, which I think is is really interesting. Um, Lauren, anything else come to mind sort of immediately in terms of partnership stuff? You know, um, just in that same example in our report, we highlighted Pepsi actually linked up with a bunch of bodegas here in the city and um, we're able to help them pay their rent for a whole year. Um, so bodegas that were carrying the Pepsi product, they met up with them and were like, we just want to thank you and help you out right now. Not so much a brand collaboration, but they did do a lot of like um, PR around it, which was cool. But just another example of like local support more so there. Yeah, I and I'm, try, I'm trying to think like, I mean, I know. Um, oh, goodness, now I'm going to forget the name of the um oh neighborhood goods again slightly different example but um neighborhood goods spoke on our stage last year they are sort of the you know trying to position themselves as the next evolution of the department store and so they rely on direct consumer brands as a way to or or new brands as a way to sort of fill their store shelves as their own stores, neighborhood goods stores closed, um, they became sort of partners in helping get um, their brand partners and small businesses who hadn't, um, you know, had an e-commerce present sort of up and running um, as well. So I think that's that's an interesting example. Again, sometimes this is um, sort of indirectly serving your community through your sort of B2B uh, partnerships and relationships that you have as well. So I think that's really interesting uh, too. Yeah, so as as mentioned, um, we do have um, a full version of the report that, um, that these insights came from, available to everyone to download. Um, Lauren just put a link in um, the chat window a couple minutes ago. If you can't get that for any reason, just feel free to reach out to us, um, Scott at PSFK or Lauren at PSFK. Well, we're happy to provide that to you. And um, we've got one more day of great content coming up tomorrow where we're gonna be talking about marketplaces. So hopefully you can join us tomorrow. Um, and you know, as we've mentioned, all the content in its sort of full glory will exist on our YouTube channel. So look out for that and sign up for that if you haven't already. Um, thanks everybody.